Chapter 3. An Unexpected Encounter with a Surprising Stranger. Do not live as if you have 10,000 years left. Your fate hangs over you. While you are still living, while you still exist on this earth, strive to become a genuinely great person, Marcus Aurelius, Roman Emperor the entrepreneur lied to the people she met at the seminar, telling them she was in the room to learn the spellbinder's fabulous formulas for exponential productivity as well as to discover the neuroscience beneath personal mastery that he had been sharing with leaders of industry. She mused that her expectation was that the guru's methodology would give her an unmatchable edge over her firm's competition allowing the business to swiftly scale toward indisputable dominance. You know the real reason she was there, she needed her hope restored. And her life saved. The artist had come to the event to understand how to fuel his creativity and multiply his capability, so he could make an enduring mark on his field by the paintings he generated. And the homeless man appeared to have sneaked into the conference hall while no one was watching. The entrepreneur and the artist had been seated together. This was the first time they'd met. Do you think he's dead? She asked as the artist fidgeted with his dangling Bob Marley dreadlocks. The entrepreneur's face was angular and long. A wealth of wrinkles and weighty crevices ran along her forehead like ruts in a farmer's fresh field. Her brown hair was medium in length and styled in an I mean business and dare not mess with me kind of a way. She was lean, like a long distance runner, with thin arms and lithe legs that emerged from a sensible blue designer skirt. Her eyes looked sad, from old hurts that had never been healed. And from the current chaos that was infecting her beloved company. Not sure. He's old. He fell hard. God, that was wild. Never seen anything like it, the artist said anxiously as he tugged on an earring. I'm new to his work. I'm not into this sort of thing, the entrepreneur explained. She stayed seated, her arms folded over a cream-colored blouse with a colossal floppy black bow tie perched fashionably at the neckline. But I liked a lot of his information on productivity in this era of devices destroying our focus and our ability to think deeply. His words made me realize I have to guard my cognitive assets in a far better way, she carried on, fairly formally. She had no real interest in sharing what she was going through, and she obviously wanted to protect her facade of an illustrious businesswoman ready to rise to the next level. Yeah, his deaf hip, said the artist, looking nervous. He's helped me so much. Can't believe what just went down. Surreal, right? He was a painter. Because he wanted to elevate his craft as well as improve his personal life, he followed the spellbinder's work. But, for whatever reason, the demons within him seemed to hold power over his greater nature. So, he'd inevitably sabotage his Herculean ambitions and wonderfully original ideas. The artist was heavy. A goatee jutted out from under his chin. He wore a black t-shirt and long black shorts that fell below his knobby knees. Black boots with rubber soles, the kind you may have seen Australians wear, completed the creative uniform. A fascinating cascade of tattoos rolled down both arms and across his left leg. One said, rich people are fakers. Another stole a line from Salvador Dali, the famed Spanish artist. It read simply, I don't do drugs. I am drugs. Hi, guys, the homeless man spoke inappropriately loudly from a few rows behind the entrepreneur and the artist. The auditorium was still emptying, and the audiovisual crew was noisily tearing down the staging. Event staff swept the floor. A Nightmares on Wax song played soothingly in the background. The two new acquaintances turned around to see a tangled mess of wild person hair, a face that looked like it hadn't been shaved in decades and a tattered arrangement of terrifically stained clothing. Yes, asked the entrepreneur in a tone as cold as an ice cube in the Arctic. Can I help you? Hey, brother, what's up, offered the artist, more compassionately. The homeless man got up, shuffled over and sat next to the two. Do you think the gurus croaked, he asked as he picked at a scab on one of his wrists. Not sure, the artist replied as he twirled another dreadlock. Hope not. Did you guys like the seminar? You into what the old-timer said, continued the scruffy stranger. Deaf, said the artist. I love his work. I have a hard time living it all, but what he says is profound. And powerful. I'm not so sure, the entrepreneur said cynically. I like a lot of what I heard today, but I'm still not convinced on some other things. I'll need some time to process it all. 
Well, I think his numero uno, stated the homeless man with a burp. I made my fortune thanks to the teachings of the spellbinder. And have enjoyed a pretty world-class life because of him, too. Most people wish for phenomenal things to happen to them. He taught me that exceptional performers make phenomenal things happen to them. And the great thing is, he not only gave me a secret philosophy to get my big dreams done, but he taught me the technology, the tactics and tools, to translate the information into results. His revolutionary insights on how to install a fiercely productive morning routine alone transformed the impact I've had on my marketplace. A jagged scar ran along the homeless man's forehead, just above his right eye. His threatening beard was grey. Around his neck he sported a beaded necklace, like the ones Indian holy men wear at their temples. Though his hyperbole made him sound unstable and his visage made it appear that he'd lived on the streets for many years, his voice displayed an irregular sense of authority and his eyes revealed the confidence of a lion. Total crackpot, the entrepreneur whispered to the artist. If he's got a fortune, I'm Mother Teresa. Got you. He seems insane, the artist replied. But check out his humongous watch. On the left wrist of the homeless man, who seemed to be in his late sixties, was one of those massive timepieces that British hedge fund managers are prone to wear when they go out to dinner in Mayfair. It had a dial the color of a revolver surrounded by a stainless steel rim, a red needle thin hour hand and a sunset orange minute hand. This noteworthy badge of honor was united with a wide black rubber strap, lending a diver-like feel to the whole luxurious look. A hundred grand, easily, said the entrepreneur discreetly. Some of the people at my shop bought watches like that the day after our IPO. Unfortunately, our share price plummeted. But they kept their damn timepieces. So, what part of the spellbinder's talk did you cats like best, the vagabond asked, still scratching his wrist. Was it all the stuff about the psychology of genius that he started out with? Or maybe those incredible models he taught on the productivity hacks of billionaires that he jammed on in the middle? Maybe you were stoked by all the neurobiology that creates top performance. Or did you vibe with his theory on our responsibility to reach legendary while serving as an instrument for the benefit of humanity, that he walked us through before that dramatic finish? The homeless man then winked. And glanced at his big watch. Hey, dudes, this has been fun. But time is one of the most precious commodities I've learned into bulletproof. Warren Buffett, the brilliant investor, said the rich invest in time. The poor invest in money. So I can't hang with you humans too long. Got a meeting with a jet and a runway. Know what I mean. He seems to be delusional, thought the entrepreneur. Buffett also said, I buy expensive suits. They just look cheap on me. Maybe you'll remember that quote, too. And, she continued, I really don't mean to be rude, but I'm not sure how you got in here. And I have no idea where you got that fat watch from or what jet you're talking about. And please stop speaking the way you do about what happened at the presentation. Nothing funny about it. Seriously, I'm not sure the gentleman's still breathing. Definite true, the artist agreed as he stroked his goatee. Not cool. And why do you talk like a surfer? Hey guys, chill, said the homeless man. First, I am a surfer. I spent my teenage years on a board in Malibu. Used to ride near a point where the rad brakes are. Now I surf the smaller waves in Tamaran Bay, a spot you cats have probably never been to. Never heard of the place. You're fairly outrageous, the entrepreneur said frostily. The homeless man was unstoppable. And second, I have been very successful in the business world. I've built a bunch of companies that are extremely profitable in this age of firms making billions in income yet nothing on their bottom line. What a joke. The world's going a little berserk. Too much greed and not enough good sense. And third, if I may, he added as his gravelly voice grew stronger, there is a plane waiting for me. On a tarmac not so far from here. So, before I go, I'll ask you again, because I want to know. What part of the Spellbinders presentation did you two like best? Pretty much the whole thing, the artist answered. Loved it all so much, I recorded every word the old legend said. That's illegal, cautioned the homeless man, crossing his arms firmly. You could get into serious lawyer trouble doing that. It is against the law, confirmed the entrepreneur. Why would you do that? Because I wanted to. Just felt like it. 
I do what I want to do. Rules are made for destruction, you know? Picasso said you should learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist. Need to be myself and not some sheep with no balls, blindly following the flock down a path that leads to nowhere. Most people, especially people with cash, are nothing but a bunch of frauds, declared the artist. It's like the spellbinder sometimes says, you can fit in. Or you can change the world. You don't get to do both. So, I recorded the whole thing. Shoot me. And jail would be interesting. I'd probably meet some cool people in there. Um, okay, said the homeless man. I don't like your decision. But I do love your passion. So, go ahead. Bring it on. Play the parts of the seminar that turned you on. Everything I recorded will blow your mind. The artist raised his arm to reveal a detailed tattoo of guitar virtuoso Jimi Hendrix. The phrase, when the power of love overcomes the love of power, the world will know peace, appeared over the dead superstar's face. You're about to hear something special, he added. Yes. Go ahead and play the parts you liked, encouraged the entrepreneur as she stood up. She wasn't quite sure why but, ever so slightly, something was beginning to shift deep within her core. Maybe life has been breaking me down, she thought. So I can make some sort of a breakthrough. Being at this event, meeting the artist, hearing the spellbinder's words, even if she didn't agree with all he said, was giving her the feeling that what she was experiencing at her firm just might be some form of preparation demanded by her greatness. The entrepreneur was still skeptical. But she sensed she was opening. And possibly growing. So, she promised herself she'd keep following this process instead of retreating. Her former way of existing no longer served her. It was time for a change. The entrepreneur thought about a quote she loved from Theodore Roosevelt, it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the door of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly. Who errs, who comes up short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring. Greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. She also recalled the phrase she'd learned from the spellbinder's address, something like, the moment when you most feel like giving up is the instant when you must find it in you to press ahead. And so, the businesswoman reached deep within herself and made a vow to continue her quest to find her answers, solve her problems and experience vastly better days. Her hope was gradually expanding, and her worries were slowly shrinking. And the small, still voice of her finest self was beginning to whisper that a very special adventure was about to begin.